is deploying Rails to your own private cloud with Open Nebula and Cobbler. Um, as you've seen with Heroku, they do all a really nice job of making it super simple for you to deploy your app. Um, but we're going to talk about different solutions. So back in the day, everybody owned or rented their own hardware. Um, you know, something like that, or actually, no, more like this. You could pay for co-locating, hosting for a premium, or shared hosting. Anybody remember cPanel? Uh, the reason why people hated it is your hardware ages, um, you know, how was that thing installed? Uh, you know, the server failed, because this guy was maintaining it. Uh, and a lot of them had really bad support. And if you remember on ramp about 10 years ago, you know, why did it take four hours for me to get my power button turned back on? And what do you mean there's no backup? So uh, people started serving a lot of their static content on places like Akamai, where they could geographically uh, disperse that. Uh, soon after, virtualization really started to emerge. And that's when Amazon EC2 kicked off. Um, you may not be aware of this, but actually Amazon runs off of the Zen plat virtualization platform. Um, soon after, other cloud providers followed, um, such as, uh, you know, those like Heroku and Rackspace and uh, um, uh, several other people. And it, it kind of came at the same time that Rails was really gaining ground. And companies could scale horizontally, you know, and, and kind of bypass some of the, the limitations of Ruby um, with basically z close to zero capital outlay. Um, and of course, made huge profits off of that. But the question is, is what is the cloud really? Well, first off, it's system automation. That's really all it is, is it's just click a button and it goes, but somebody has to build up all those steps in between. And then secondly, it's the ability to geographically disperse your system, not care where it is, because a lot of the hosting providers you used to deal with, you had to be in that one data center facility. Um, but the question is, is what happens when what you want is outside of the nice playground that they give you? Um, well, you know, first question is, I thought this was in the cloud. Why, why are my servers only in Chicago, as an example? Or, you know, there's, you provide everything, but you know, I really thought you would have provided something else. And maybe your SLA that you're getting from your provider is unacceptable. Um, and what does, it, what does it really get you? You know, you've got you know, different processor architectures, different speeds. Um, you know, they can give you virtual cores, so you're not actually getting your own dedicated cores. Um, is it being shared with other people? If their website gets hit really hard, is my website going to suffer because of that? Um, what kind of data I.O. are they using? Uh, you know, what kind of bandwidth is that data I.O.? That can make a huge difference in what you're doing. Um, you know, what speed are the drives that are being used? You know, all these questions, um, when you go to your, your providers, when you just let it go off into the, to the netherworld and, and you stop asking these questions, um, you know, that may make a difference later on. Uh, what kind of redundancy do you have as far as the network connection? Um, and then where is your data? You know, uh, well, you know, it just so happens that your server goes down because the FBI raids something. Um, or, you know, Amazon's East Coast goes down again. Uh, security vulnerabilities within virtualization architectures themselves, because uh, you're basically on a shared platform unless you negotiate um, dedicated hardware. Uh, you know, what is that legal implica implications, especially if you're dealing with federal regulations? Um, and then, is my website slow because the service is slow, or is it slow because my code is slow? So for most, maybe that you know isn't a big deal. Maybe what you get out of it, you don't have to ask these questions. You don't want to spend the time learning all this stuff that people learned years ago, and, and you don't have to do. And a lot of the times, the people who who had that knowledge harbored it for uh, ill gain, you know, so that they could keep control of things. Uh, and you potentially still need to negotiate those contracts to where your actual systems are going to go. Um, so a lot of private clouds are emerging right now, such as uh, Eucalyptus has probably been around the longest. Um, not all of the components are open source, but most of that's changing. They also do a lot of uh, uh, high computing cluster type integration with like Rocks cluster. 
Um, you've got OpenStack. It's been pretty immature, but um, but it's getting it's moving very rapidly, so it's maturing very fast. Uh, but it is changing hands. I think right now Rackspace and NASA are, are colluding on this right now. Um, and it used to be not fully open source stack, which is why I chose not to go with it, as well as the, um, the command line immaturity. Um, and then there was also cloud.com, which actually looked the best, and, and it was something that you could put in like a systems person's hands to manage your hardware. But um, unfortunately, there was some stability issues with installation and uh, limitations on uh, what kind of storage you could use and how you could use it. And now it's owned by Citrix, so that's a big thumbs down on my perspective. So. Uh, what I ended up using was a, a platform called Open Nebula. It is fully open source. Um, it has reasonably good documentation, but you know, if you want to get into some complex installations, which I'm sure is the same with the other ones, I just you know didn't get a chance to actually get that deep. Um, you know, it takes takes some, some working with. The web UI is pretty decent, and it's written in Ruby. So if we want to make changes to it or make it better, you know, we don't have to learn Python, which I really like. Um, and then there's also a really powerful hooks interface um, to where you can trigger uh, certain things to happen once your deployments are running or started or shut down, so on and so forth. Um, in addition to that, you can kind of complement your private cloud system with a, a system called Cobbler. And uh, it, it actually can be treated as though it were its own private cloud system. It has that capability, but it's mostly command line, and there's just better benefits of the other systems. Uh, but it is the best PXE boot I've ever seen. Um, I've been looking for a good PXE boot system for you know decades, and this tops the cake. Uh, Puppet is also uh, provisioning. Uh, so once you get your actual server up and ready to go, you need it to, to do something. So you need it to run an application. Uh, so Puppet could be one way to do that. Of course, uh, it's uh, trying to put a, an object-oriented hammer into a non-object-oriented hole. Um, so it, it can be fun to work with. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it does work. So in this case, I actually ended up using Puppet for a lot of my automation, and that's where I learned a lot of these pains. So that's why I don't speak as highly of it. Uh, I do hear a lot of good things about Chef, um, but haven't had a really chance to do it because some of their uh, changes between different versions have been kind of unstable. Um, and, a, and the nice thing is that the UI is not payware, whereas with Puppet you have to you know, get the enterprise version. So, let me go ahead and uh, walk you through a little bit of, of this Puppet stuff, or Open Nebula stuff. So the first thing that I did is I actually created a, a KVM instance here. So it's actually KVM's running as the base installation in the OS, and I can run uh, various virtual images on that. So as you can see here, um, if I go to my virtual machine manager, um, I can see all my systems that are running here. In fact, I'm going to delete this one. Um, and I'm actually running the cloud system on the same box that I'm going to be deploying this virtualization stuff to. So, um, so that's not really a problem. And you can see here is where I define that host. So, uh, so you can deploy any number of KVM hosts, and it will automatically distribute your uh, machines across those hosts based on available resources. Um, you have the idea of templates. So I define three templates here, a production template, a database template, and an Nginx template so that I can create a nice Rails uh, production level environment. Um, you also have the networks that they run on. Uh, so in this case, I only have one network, but you can actually take your KVM box, put it on a port trunk, and assign different VLANs to it and have all of your uh, instances on different VLANs depending upon their security. And you can define that when you deploy it. Um, I don't have any images right now, so what I, what I like to do is I like to say, when you're building something, you want to build it so that you can build it from scratch in an automated fashion so that you never have to go back and build that again. You, you, too often people build these systems by hand and then you don't know how it was built, it's domain knowledge, the person goes away, who knows what. And a lot of your developers aren't necessarily strong in that, in that regard either. So you want to use a system, a complete stack system that serves as a running documentation of your system. So what I chose to do is I chose to do a, a PXE boot type environment. But the nice thing is once you prepare that, that PXE booted system and that becomes your template, 
um, you can then prepare it into an image that you can then bootstrap and do a much quicker deployment than, than what I would demonstrate. Um, so if we go to virtual machines, uh, we've got one that was running. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, so all I have to do is, once I've set up my templates, I just say new, give it a name, and I'm going to deploy the database server. And as you saw, I could actually deploy as many as I wanted. You can deploy five database servers. Of course, someone have to put the trickery in the, in the wires and get them all talking to each other if you wanted to do like a replicated setup or, or something like that. Um, so it takes a little bit to kick off. One thing that you can do is you can uh, get all these little options that are typically available on the command line, but you can force a deployment. Um, you know, if it, because it has a scheduler, so it may not kick off immediately, but in this case, it, it, it's already kicked it off. And we can actually see it's running now, and we get a nice little VNC access. This runs in HTML5 web sockets, but you can back it up with a Flash-based system. Um, bear with me, I've just got to open up the ports. Okay, so if I go back to it, reopen my VNC console, um, there it is. So um, unfortunately I didn't uh, get it quick enough, but if, if we had seen it from the beginning, we would have actually seen it hit the, uh, the, uh, the boot P server, the TFTP server, grab an IP address, and then it points it to where to get its configuration from. And that's what's actually handled by Cobbler. Cobbler can pick that up and, and serve that out. So let me, let me demonstrate a little bit of the concepts of Cobbler. So... Oops. Okay, so Cobbler has the, uh, the um, design of uh, templates, so you define your Kickstart templates, and for anybody who's not familiar with Kickstarting, it's basically a, a definition of how that, that machine gets physically installed, as though you put the OS disk into the uh, CD-ROM and actually pick the options that you wanted on that. So you can see here we're doing uh, some little fix-ups to set the, the host name. Uh, Apologize if the screen resolution is kind of low, but um, there's also these variables that Cobbler will give you that will insert some pre-canned stuff because, as an example, the, the actual Cobbler URL is dynamic, so it needs to, to put that in there. Um, I actually created my own little snippet um, to set the default root password as an example so I can have a consistent password across my systems when they're first deployed. So if we go down to the snippets, we can see that here. And you can see my cryptid password as an example. Um, another good example would be uh, deploying my authorized keys. So I need a system to be able to you know, connect to this once it's deployed and prepared so I actually have physical ac access to it. So I've added in a couple authorized keys there during the actual installation process. Um, if we go back, uh, the other thing that, so one thing that I forgot to mention is everything that I've done here, um, I actually don't have internet access. Everything that's happening here is happening without ever touching anything outside of this machine, which is important because if your internet goes down and you need to deploy something internally, if, if this is private, um, you know, your, your SOL. So everything I've done here is to self-contain all of these services um, so that they can be hosted locally. So we've got Yum repositories, which are, are synced locally with Cobbler. We've got, I actually took RVM and I got RVM running to where I just fetch it locally and install it and have the Rubies pre-prepared. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, Ruby itself automatically compiles itself and gets itself running. Um, and, uh, and then I actually do get it to a point to where I can, bam, cap deploy it. And that's it. I, I do a cap deploy and it's ready. Um, I have it 
registering in DNS automatically uh, using a convention so that you can deploy that. Uh, it does take a while on this machine because of the disk I.O. It does take a while for these to install, so unfortunately I won't be able to demonstrate a full uh, three-server system. Um, but if you stick around, I can probably show it to you in a, in a few hours or so. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. It's actually going out and uh, it's going to about go ahead and install those packages. So, um, so going back to Cobbler, you can see uh, once you've got your Kickstarter templates set up, um, you can actually create a profile. So it's very similar uh, as the, the, the open uh, Nebula stuff is. Um, so you get a profile. So once again, I created three profiles, uh, one for the database, one for Nginx, and one for production. And I can actually view the Kickstart file and see what it did and what it inserted into, uh, into my Kickstart. Um, so you can see here all the packages that I had it installed. So this is a Postgres server, so I have it installed Postgres. And uh, get it started with Puppet as well. Here's the authorized keys that it uh, integrates. Here's where it sets Puppet and, and gets it ready so that when it reboots, it's actually going to go and grab its configuration. Uh, configuring some of the default network stuff, uh, setting the clock, you know. Uh, and then lastly, um, these ones actually override the default uh, repo YUM repositories and use my own internal repositories so we're not having to, to go out and get that. So if we look at the production system as an example, it's pretty similar as well. So there's a lot, you know, everything that you do, you kind of rinse and repeat, you put it into a snippet so that it's reusable. So that is what the cobbler stuff does. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let this cook. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them at this point. Yes? Okay, so the question is, would this run on multiple machines? Um, so as an example, uh, you would have to set up a second server um, if you wanted like two cloud servers. Um, but you can run as many KVM hosts as you need. So if you, if you go into here and hosts, um, you just keep adding them in. Just create new KVM hosts. Um, and then uh, uh, it will send out those virtual machines, or, or it prepares those virtual machines and balances them across the, the KVM hosts. So you can have this one control center manage a whole rack of, of servers that are sitting there just to serve virtual, uh, virtual clients. Okay, that's a great question. And I'm going to be publishing uh, my actual configuration, and I'll actually publish the the image of the cloud system as a, a virtual image. But just to kind of give you an idea, I've uh, painstakingly spent numerous hours getting this prepared. Um, so as an example, oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, um, uh, what configuration is actually needed to get this up and going? So as an example, I have I have documented all the steps that it took from a base bare installation, so minimal Linux installation, um, and documented all the steps that it took for me to get Open Nebula working. Uh, first off, and unfortunately, there are quite a few things that are. I mean, it's complex. It's it's not an easy thing to do. So there's a lot of knowledge that I've built up there. So uh, the the long-term idea would be, okay, well, you've created the system to automate everything. Well, create a way to automate making that system. You know, kind of make it uh, reciprocal in that sense. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to get that. That was one of my goals, but uh, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll get that going. Um, you can also see here the KVM host itself, getting that set up. There's some, uh, some trickery in here in the way that uh, KVM handles the user that's actually deploying this. Um, so I had to add in like some Paul Kit stuff and, and uh, actually configure libvirt D in a certain way. So, you know, this isn't stuff you can just find out there on the net. I've been using Linux for, you know, decades, so I'm really strong in this stuff, but your average person isn't, isn't going to have this kind of knowledge. So, okay. Yeah, no, no problem. How does this compare to the cloud set server setup? Without any SFDs, it's like 
Right, so I mean, it's all, it all depends on what your needs are. I mean, if your needs are pretty basic, there's no reason to go to this kind of complexity unless you're just a control freak. You know, maybe I'm a little bit of a control freak, but um, so the question is, um, you know, what is the advantage of doing this over, you know, just using a cloud provider? Um, so as an example, you know, as I cited in, in some of that, that uh, sure. So there's other solutions that uh, potentially do this sort of stuff. Uh, what I'm presenting here is more of a full stack solution. So um, you know, this with three clicks of the button, I deploy three servers, and without doing anything else, I have a system and environment ready for me to do a, a cat deploy. Um, so I'm not handling just the, the OS installation or just the, the VM creation. Um, so the so the advantage of this would be, you know, you having potentially more control over your entire environment, and, and uh, you know, there may be financial risks with, you know, leaving this in other people's hands outside of yours. You know, you, that you know, it's not their business to make sure that your stuff is working. It's their business to make sure a thousand people's stuff is working. So it really just comes down to your needs. So, yes. Can you run Windows Yes? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know the Puppet if Puppet particularly works well with that. Also, Cobbler is really more geared towards a Linux-based installation with kickstarting. So you'd be better off. Uh, Windows has the uh, advanced. It used to be called the Riz server, but it's now called like the advanced deployment server or something like that. So you could deploy with Open Nebula, but then you would have to have that Windows stuff up and running and ready to pick it up off the network and do that all that automated sysprep and all that kind of stuff. So there's no reason that Open Nebula couldn't interface with that, but uh, but all the other stuff would be kind of uh, geared more towards the, the Linux and the, and the Ruby installation. So. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thank you for your uh, patience. <laughs> it was uh, a bit difficult with these technical difficulties. And if you stick around, I will show you uh, when I have all three servers up and going and, and we deploy now. So thank you. Well, I guess that concludes the...